Welcome back to Run Elite. Now, what I'm going to share with you today here is super cool. This is awesome. You're going to love it. I call it two unlikely data points that predict race time performance. Now, what are we talking about? There was some research done by yours truly and colleagues at Colby Sawyer College in New Hampshire. Now, what we did was we tried to predict, we tried to create a mathematical formula where you can predict your 5,000 meter race time performance based off of very simple inputs and very few inputs. And we were able to do it. And I'm going to share that formula with you at the end of this video. But I'm going to tell you how we got there and what it means. So what we did was we took 40 athletes from division one, two, and three colleges that were currently running their track and field season. So they had current race times. And a lot of the athletes we used were from Dartmouth College, and this was while Ben True was there. So Ben was uh, traveling for a race or something. He wasn't there, but a lot of his teammates were. So a lot of um, really high caliber runners, people running in the 13s and the 14s and the 15s for a 5K, like pretty fast, right? We also had people in the 16s and 17s and 18s as well. So basically all really well-trained athletes. Now what we looked at was a couple of key inputs. Now I'm going to break down for you what we measured. The first thing that we measured was their aerobic capacity. And we did that by estimating their VO2 max. Now here's what we did. We did something called the forest service step test. Now this is a standardized test that, uh, the American college of sports medicine created. And you basically step up and down and up and down on a box and you measure heart rate before and after. And what is amazing about this is two things. It's very specific for runners because it's done at a cadence of one revolution every uh, 90 revolutions per minute, which is 180 steps per minute, right? Now we know that 180 steps per minute is basically the most efficient cadence to be running at 180 or more. We know that. And so it closely mimics mimic wool is that instead of bringing these runners in and testing them for VO2 max, which they would probably never do during season because you have to run to exhaustion on a treadmill with a gas mask. And good luck trying to get a competitive runner in their season when it's not a race to run to exhaustion. They probably, it's not a good idea, right? So you can very closely approximate VO2 max within 5%. Now that's pretty incredible. So we did that. The second thing we did was take this, this device called a goniometer. It basically has two arms on a on an axis like this, and you use it to measure joint angles. Now we measured the major angles of the lower extremity, the hip, the knee, and the ankle. And I'll tell you what we found. So I'm going to share the statistics here. And don't worry, if you want to take a screenshot of this, if you're uh, a statistic nerd, and you really want to look into the statistical significance and the regressions and the, all this stuff, you can, but don't worry, I'm going to make this really simple. So let's first take a look at race time performance and VO2 max. Now, what we found was that they're highly correlated. Basically, what that means is that your as your VO2 max goes up, your race time goes down. So that's a negative correlation, hence why you see a downward slope here on this graph. And it was statistically significant. Now, remember that VO2 max is not a limiter of your performance, but it is highly correlated with your performance. Now let's take a look at the really cool stuff. This is the stuff that I would have never seen coming. Now I did have a prediction um, on kind of what we would see when we measured the flexibility of different angles, but I wouldn't have guessed to find exactly what we did. I'm gonna share that with you here. So the first thing is let's take a look at the calf flexibility. So looking at the calf, you got two muscles in the calf and they act on the Achilles tendon and to pull your toes down basically, right? So what we did is we measured the flexibility of that of the calf by have, by pulling their toes up towards their head and you can see how tight the calf is. We measured that and we found a very high correlation between how tight not how flexible and loose how tight the calf is and race time performance. Now that makes sense. I'm going to give you a little bit of the reason why you have these, these things inside of your muscles called muscle t uh, spindles and Golgi tendon apparatus. And without getting too much into it, think of it this way. If you stretch a muscle nice and easy and slow, you can stretch it pretty far, right? But if you stretch something quickly, 
Your body doesn't want to rip a muscle. So if there's a quick stretch on something, there's a reaction that you have where the muscle will contract. And it's kind of like a rubber band, right? So if you think, if you stretch your rubber band, it takes, when, when you want to, the two ends to come back together, do you need to push them back together? Do you need to create a contraction or can you just let it go and you get free energy, right? It's the same thing in your muscles and your tendons is that when there's the stretch reflex put on them, you, you get an elastic return. You get almost free energy. So the tighter the calf, the more elastic rebound there is and the more free energy you have to run forwards. So you can see it by how having some free energy would actually would make you a faster runner, right? That's what we found. But you can maybe even predict that, and we did predict that because it's almost obvious. But here's what was not obvious. When we looked at rotation of the hip. So we looked at external rotation at the hip and I'm going to put some pictures up here so you can see what the muscles are that act to externally rotate the hip and then a picture so you can see what hip external rotation actually looks like because sometimes it's hard to uh, visualize. Um, now what we found is that there was, yes, there was a correlation, but it was not statistically significant. Okay, here's what was. We looked at the internal rotators of the hip. Now I'm going to put up some of the muscles here. Um, that's not a comprehensive list of the muscles that internally rotate the hip. You also have some of your adductor muscles that do it, but so you can get a ballpark. Now the position that this guy in the lower right is in, he is currently in an internally rotated position, about to move into an externally. Okay, so just look at that. That is what an internal rotation of the hip looks like. And I'll show you more pictures of people running who actually have this position. Now, look at the correlation there. That is a much steeper curve. Uh, there, it's very statistically significant. So let's break this down and see what does it mean for you? Well, let's take a look at hip flexion. So if you think of like running with high knees, that's hip flexion. Now you want that range of motion to be very easy. So you want it to be loose, okay? So you, you can do stretches of the muscles on the, on the opposite side of the glutes, for example, and that is going to be beneficial for you. Now let's look at hip extension. So that's the leg behind the body. You also want that to be pretty loose. And so stretching the muscles on the front of the leg, like the hip flexors, is a good idea. You want to maintain range of motion because check this guy out here. He's got a huge stride angle. The stride angle, excuse me, is the... Um, the angle between the, the two thighs. It's very big. You want to be able to achieve a large stride angle when you need to, because when you're running fast, you have a large stride angle. If you can't do it, you can't, you can't sprint basically. Now, here's what we found is that the calf mobility, like I say, the tighter, the better, but, and you can, you can, you can, um, increase the tightness of your calf by doing things like plyometrics, like, uh, depth jumps, like, jump rope and fast paced running, sprinting, strides, hill sprints, things like that. We're going to come back to that in a second, but here's the cool one. Let's take a look at hip internal rotation. So we got four guys here. You see Mo Farah over on the right. You can actually see Bernard Lagat in the middle there in the back. It's, I just noticed that, but take a look at Mo on the right. Look where his foot on the ground is pointed straight ahead. Now look at the two guys on the left, both feet hitting the ground pointed straight ahead. Now this is going to get interesting. So they're at the end of a race sprinting. The fact that they're at the end of the race means that they're fatigued. And the fact that they're sprinting for the win, it means that they're, they're trying really hard. They're going through maximal contractions. And, uh, if there's any flaw or weakness, it's going to show up. It's going to be during the kick. Now take a look at the guy next to Mo second from the right. Look at his foot. That's interesting. He's going to hit the ground with his toes pointed out almost 45 degrees from the direction he's wanting to go. Now that's very interesting because when his foot touches the ground, if he doesn't change the orientation of his body, he's going to start running at a 45 degree angle and that's not efficient whatsoever. So what's going to happen is when he hits the ground, he's now going to have to rotate at the hip in order to stay moving forward. Now, all of the runners are going to have to do that. When you land on one foot, if you jumped and you landed on two feet under your center of mass, your hips don't have to turn you at all. But when you land on one foot, 
there's a tendency to start rotating if you're moving forward. And so, so, so you don't touch the ground and start rotating when you're running. That wouldn't be very efficient, would it? You have to contract the internal rotators to keep yourself oriented forward. And so what you're seeing here is that he, those muscles are fatigued in the guy second from the right here. And that makes sense because it's at the end of a race. Now let's take a look at an excellent example with some female runners here. So this is a clip uh, from a respectable distance running website. But I want you to notice that the text here says, example of a weak abductors and hips. Now I am creating the argument here that it, they, they actually don't have weak abductors and hips. So these are high level, elite level women competing on the world stage. This is Boston Marathon. So do you think that you can be a, a top finisher at Boston and have some amazingly weak abductors and amazingly weak hips? Maybe. But here's what I think is going on. When you look at their trail leg, the one that's off of the ground behind them and kind of rotated, what are you seeing there? You're seeing an internal rotation of the hip. Now, I don't think that's because their hips are weak. I think it's because they have tight internal rotators of the hip. Now, recall that one of the best predictors of race time performance is how tight those internal rotators are. So is it a coincidence that these women would have a tight internal hip rotators and they would also be top performers, very highly trained, high performing athletes? Those things are highly correlated. And so the fact that we're seeing this here isn't necessarily a detriment. It probably tells, tells you that their glutes are a little bit fatigued and for good reason at the end of a marathon, right? But it doesn't say that their abductors and hips are necessarily weak. In fact, this is good evidence to support the uh, mathematical formula that I'm going to share with you. So here's what we found. We found that aerobic capacity, tightness in the calf, and tightness in the internal rotators are great predictors of performance. Now here's, I'm going to give you two take-home messages. <clears throat> These are the things that you want to maximize. You want to maximize your aerobic capacity. You want to maximize how tight your calf and your internal hip rotators are. And then as kind of a runner up, these aren't as important, but they're, they're still pretty darn important is that you want to maintain range of motion in your uh, quads and your hamstrings. So those are the five takeaways there. Now, how do you do these? You can build your aerobic capacity through hill sprints. Basically you want to do, you want to increase your stroke volume. Now, when your heart beats once, the amount of blood that comes out of it is your stroke volume. So if you can have more blood come out of it with one contraction, you can see why that might be advantageous for distance running, right? Less work, less pumps your heart has to do in order to move the same amount of blood. And you can do that by basically weight training your heart and you want to jack the, the heart rate up really high, really quick. And you can do that with things like hill sprints. You also want to do lots of volume of training to get the heart working at a, at a higher rate than at rest for a long period of time. You can increase the tightness of your calf by doing things like plyometrics. You can increase the tightness of your internal rotators of your hip by doing things that are like high velocity running, maybe strides, maybe sprints, hill sprints again, or race pace running. And then to keep your hamstrings and your quads loose, you can do some light stretching and you can again do some nice, easy strides, nothing crazy, but you want to get that range of motion up there without fatigue. Now, if you take a look at all of those, check this out. You can move them around and they start to sort of fall into some categories They start to fall into your base training, support training and specific training. Now we have a whole other training on exactly how to break those down, but there's a reason why during base training, we, we aren't just doing easy running. We're also doing hill sprints because that's a great time for us to start to improve our stroke volume. For example, we're also doing a lot of easy runs because it, it also improves the stroke volume and we're doing light stretching and during light stretching, okay? And now look at support. In support, we're also doing some plyometric training, things like depth jumps and jump rope and strides and a little bit of track work. Now, the reason it goes in support and not in base training is because remember you need 
a base of strength before you can start doing plyometrics or your injury risk goes sky high. You need to have strength first. So you build strength in base training. So you see how there's a rhyme and a reason to, at least it's starting here to kind of unfold why we're putting certain things in certain areas of our training. And so these are your uh, take home points here. And as promised, I'm going to share with you the mathematical formula for predicting race time performance. Now, this is going to look maybe a little alien to you at first, but I'm going to explain it. Race time performance. This is for your 5,000 meter race time performance specifically. Okay. So ideally it would be run on a track, a really controlled surface. Now you take your time in seconds. So just convert your minutes times them by 60 and then add on in the other seconds. Boom. That's your race time in seconds. Now that equals these two things, 854 minus 7.78 times your VO2 max. Now VO2 max, you could have it measured uh, at a XFIS clinic, or you can do that heart, that forest service step test and you can approximate it. Now it only takes a few minutes and you only need a few devices. Probably best if you're a physical therapist or athletic trainer does this because they'll have all the right equipment for you, but it's very easy to do. And then you add that number to 12.03 times the internal rotation of your hip. And that's measured in degrees. So you only need two inputs, your VO2 max and your hip tightness, basically. And you can predict your race time performance. Or what's really fun is if you want to estimate your VO2 max, you can put in your race time performance and you can put in your hip flexibility and you just divide race time by hip flexibility, boom, and you can predict your race time performance. Now that, I mean, you can predict your VO2 max. That's pretty cool. I love that. So that is a really simple thing. I'll bet you've never seen that before uh, because it took a year of research in order to uh, extrapolate all this and uh, get the approval for it um, and get the consent from the athletes and do all that. So I want to share that with you. And here's the, what I want you to really leave here with is that there are a lot of things you can do to improve your performance in your race, but it's not necessarily all so complicated. What this formula is saying is that the quality of what's going on inside aerobically really matters. And what we're saying here with the tightness of the muscles, remember that the calf is also really important, but when we plugged that into the formula, it made it slightly less reliable, still a great predictor, highly correlated, but these were the two most contributing factors. But what we're seeing is that as the muscles become tighter, they're able to respond better elastically and you get more free energy. Now you don't want every muscle to be tight because you could imagine that that's not the best approach, but you do want some muscle groups to be tight and some muscle groups to have a great range of motion. So you want to stretch your, uh, your quads, your hamstrings and your hip flexors, and you want to keep tight. And the way that you do that is through plyometrics and fast paced running for your calf and for your hip, uh, internal rotators. And the only way to do that is basically through, I mean, you could get in the gym and do certain exercises, but through running, you're going to do it through uh, big ranges of motion. And that happens when you're running fast, fast and controlled. So things like strides on a straightaway on a track, don't make it too difficult uh, on the trails and things like that. You want it to be very controlled, either running uphill. Now uphill is great because it's a less injury risk, less impact. You should start early like that. And then as your season goes on, you can get on the track and do a fast paced running and it doesn't have to be long you're not conditioning your vo2 max and your lactate threshold you're conditioning the tightness in your muscles so all you need to do is achieve a fast pace and hold it for five ten seconds and then relax it and so that sounds a lot like a stride right so i hope you got something awesome from this and i can't wait to share even more of this information with you thank you now, if you guys want to find out more and get some awesome value, you can watch the, our free webinar and just follow the link below and you're going to get a, uh, an absolutely free class. I'm going to take you through a whole bunch of mindset and elite level training that's going on in the world right now that you may be unaware of because it's based on the cutting edge science. Second is you can come join our Facebook group and you can speak with like-minded people who are distance runners looking to really improve themselves and you'll get all kinds of access to free content on the cutting edge science and mindset behind distance running training. I'll see you in there. Thank you for watching.